Hey, this week on Pay Dirt, we're out with Tondo Waldron, Realtree Lambro, right here on the Kansas, Missouri line, and he's gonna teach me something I know absolutely nothing about, and that's upland game bird management here in the Midwest. Tondo has done an excellent job on his place of improving this place for quail habitat. He's also, you know, made a great place for his turkeys to nest and a great place, you know, for his deer, the deer to hold up and move in these travel corridors. We're having a great hunt this week, and I think it has a lot to do with all the stuff Tondo has done on this place. Thank you for having us out. You bet. And Tondo, tell us, now you told me you're actually getting paid to put in these quail buffers on your place, right? Exactly. Yeah, so that's just a program, and it's it, there's many programs that are out there, but this one, I mean, it's it's there's so many wins involved in it, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, the government will pay you to create habitat for quail. So essentially they tell you to uh, put in a 30-foot wide strip along all of your crop fields, and they pay us $88 an acre. Uh, it's a, a five, 10, or 15 year contract. And, and we essentially put 30 yard strips everywhere around where we have crops. Um, the benefit is, you know, we grow quail. We, we have quail on the property. The greater benefit, is, as you see, this is the highway that runs in front of our property. So if anyone going up and down the highway wants to know what kind of deer I have in my crop fields, they can't see into my, my fields because this buffer strip becomes a green screen that hides my fields. So all the way around my entire farm, I have buffer strips that they're paying me for. So I get to hunt quail and uh, the people just don't know what I have inside my farm. It, it blocks it. Uh, you know, there are people out there that like to road hunt and they shine the lights into the property. Right, right. Well, you, you can't shine a light through a quail buffer strip. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, this also makes your place hunt bigger because, you know, out here on the highway, well, you wouldn't have any kind of bedding or along these fence rows, you're going to have, you know, like you said, 30 foot of extra bedding. Is that right? Bedding and it creates travel corridors. So we connect. So when I look at properties, I look for how much timber interconnects to a property. Well, now these buffer strips become a, a a part of what interconnects to other properties. So I can get deer to travel along these buffer strips. Right. You know, so it's intentional how we're doing it. You know, of course you want your place to pay back. You want your investment to pay back. And essentially I can make better quail and deer and turkey habitat and still have a great investment because like you said, you're getting paid. You know, some people buy a property because they want great fishing, they want great hunting. So now it just makes it more diverse. So I can say this property is great because it has fishing, it has um, whitetail hunting, it has quail hunting. So it, it just, it expands it. So now it's, it's valuable to a broader audience. If you don't mind, Tondo, let's go out and look at some of these quail buffer strips and kind of tell us a little bit more about it. I'd be glad to, that'd be awesome. Well, Tondo, this is one of the, what did you call this program? CP33. CP33. And how long ago did you put this one in? Uh, over 15 years ago. You know, there's some stipulations behind it. You can't just plant it and let it go. What's the, what's the deal? With right. It? So you have to maintain it You okay. you because you know what happens with properties like this. If, if we just let it go, it just goes willy nilly. So you have to maintain it. So uh, as part of the program, they stipulate that you either have to burn a third, disc a third or mow a third every year. 
um, and you just have to rotate that around. Um, so we happen to have a, you know, a 16 foot wide mower. So for us to do a third of the 30 wide strip, you can either do the left, the middle or the center. Right, right. I saw that you picked the center and were real strategic about that. Now, why was that? There's a few reasons why I like to do the center. Um, so it's quail habitat. So when you go quail hunting, you walk comfortably down the middle and the dog can work left and work right you know, all the way down and, you know, we're just following along and not tripping. So I like to do it on the center for that. But I also like it, you know, the deer like to follow that path of least resistance. So when you mow it out down the center, the deer will follow that track. It's CP33 is um, native grasses. Mm -hmm. So you want to put in grass that the quail can run in. So when we're standing over and looking down, you'll see that a quail can maneuver in that. And, and the goal is for a quail to survive you know, an attack from a hawk. Right. So that's the next level. What we see is the shrubby cover. So you'll see patches of shrubby cover, you know, all every uh, 30 yards going down. Well, that shrubby cover, you'll see how I mow and then stop at the shrubby cover. We don't mow through that. We leave that for the quail, but it also helps. So if I'm trying to get to that side of the field to hunt and, and there's deer in this uh, lane that I cut, I can get to that shrubby cover and peek around to the next one and then then move on to the next one and just keep working my way down the field because there's times when you get in and out of your stand, you just don't want the deer to see you. This shrubby cover, that's to keep, what all predators, of course, you got coyotes, what's some, you know, that, what's some other, other stuff, stuff that are? Bobcats, hawks, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, a bobcat, a bobcat can't maneuver through that fast enough at the, the I mean, they can, but this gives the quail a fighting chance. Same with coyotes. Um, but hawks, hawks swoop in out of the sky. Well, a hawk can't swoop in with its wings spread and talons out and grab a quail out of a shrubby cover. And while we were just talking, I looked right here. Look at the darn deer trail right here on the edge of this cover. I mean, what you're doing is working. And it looks like you've mowed this before, so the deer just exactly path they feel resistance. safe. Yeah, we we mow it intentionally so that we can walk this edge and just see the scrapes on these tree limbs hanging down all the way down the edge. Okay, I'm a landowner. I just bought my property from you. I want to put this in the CP33 program. That's right. Yes. Okay. What's my what's my what's my next step? Give me the the quick of it. Um, I. It's simple. I give you the phone number for your county um, FSA office okay. and, and you make that call and tell them your landowner and here's your land and you would like to talk to the um, uh, NRCS department okay. and they will assign an agent to you and that agent gladly will come out and do all of this with you. So it's pretty easy. And they're excited for it because they are saying they that's it's like we have a passion for land. Right. They have a passion for habitat. Mm -hmm. So they 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 the NRCS guy has become a lifelong friend. He's mm -hmm. and and now I rely on him as a resource. When I get stumped on something, I can call Randy and Randy will tell me, hey. Uh, why don't you try this? Why don't you go in this direction? So he's become a resource and it's because he loves what he does. Like we love what we do. Tondo, when we're sitting here just talking, you know, you're talking about this train right here and something cool I thought Tondo just brought up was how he uses the train and the noise you know, to get in, you know, the deer used to it. It's an everyday, a couple of day thing. So when the train, ba 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 ba, and and tell the horn, that's when you're getting in and out of the stand. Exactly. Like it, we go to such great lengths to get in and out of the stand so silently. It's like, don't let your strap hit on the metal stand. The little tink, and and we've seen it happen. That little bitty noise gets the deer alerts in them. Gets it. Right. You know, they're 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 heading out of dodge. But um, if you're in Kansas, dodge. Uh, but but when that train's going, like we use that train. Uh, so it's every, it's on the hour. So on the hour, we know oh, time to get out of the stand because it covers your sound getting down, right. getting right. out, or we use it when we get in. If I'm a buyer and I'm looking for a property, just because it's got a train tracks right by it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And you know, I find a lot of sheds along the train tracks. Just traveling back and forth. Yeah, they use it. The, the, the deer take that path of least resistance and, you know, going up and down those train tracks, that's the path of least resistance. This week's featured property comes from Southern Iowa in Ringgold County. 
This area is known for its world-class deer hunting, and arguably some of the best deer in the world are taken in this area. This track has two large drains going through it, and some of the pasture ground could be converted to crop ground to make for great deer hunting with additional income. So if you're looking for a great place with good income and great deer hunting in a great area, check out this 280 acres in Ringgold County. If you like this property or properties like this, check out RealtreeUC.com today. Hey, we're out here with Dan Smith with TNC Hunt Club, and uh, I appreciate you having us out. This was a great opportunity sure. for us to um, shoot some pheasants. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions about TNC Hunt Club. Uh, uh, you guys have how many acres here? We are just shy of 9,000 acres. And on that 9,000 acres, what do you guys offer here? Full service range of, uh, of course, deer and turkey, upland game experience, as well as waterfowl and goose uh, experience for across all, 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 all facets. The outdoor range. spectrum. You got it. Well, we were out on the shoot. I talked to you a bunch about the upland birds and the habitat and what you guys have done to really enhance it here and not, not just to make it, um, you know, uh, suitable for the birds, but something that the birds will want to stay in. So tell me a little bit more about that. When we took over, there had been some deferred maintenance on a lot of our really optimal bird habitat. So first thing we did was implement a, a pretty aggressive fire program. Uh, fire is your friend, both spring and summer burns. Uh, staggered in a way that lets the habitat uh, really give you a wide diversity of growth and structure throughout a full hunting season. Uh, also employ a pretty aggressive herbicide uh, program manage noxious weeds. We consider fescue a noxious weed. Ceresia, of course. Uh, other habitat that really doesn't give much benefit to upland game habitat. The offshoot, uh, an additional benefit, is incredible thermal cover for deer and turkey for us as well, for nesting and bedding. But that's just an added bonus to the aggressive program that we put in place. Another thing that we've implemented is the buffer strip program. So a lot of our crop fields, we've added a 50-foot barrier. Uh, native grass, uh, switchgrass, uh, a lot of cool season grasses. So uh, we've been highly successful with getting a response in a short amount of time. And uh, you know, sky's the limit when you've got people that are willing to work hard and you got some creativity in the way that you manage your habitat. What would you consider as the biggest competitor for upland game birds? Of course, coyotes and bobcats are natural predators, but don't underestimate the impact of feral cats as well as raccoons and possums. Uh, getting in, disrupting the nest, finding eggs on nest, not only for upland game, but also for, for wild turkey. You know that I, I'm avid on whitetail hunting and, and you know I have great relationships with my farmers and um, it's great how I can ask a farmer to leave uh, 10 acres in the corner of a 400 acre field because I know that's gonna be key for where I'm gonna hunt. Uh, but I know you, you spoke about it yesterday about how you um, rotationally hay your fields to, to leave bedding for the quail. So we've worked with our with our tenant farmers to develop a program where seasonally we rotate how we hay a field and where we hay a field. Again, allows for income, allows for that farmer to help be a good steward of the property with us, in partnership with us. And it also allows us to leave, again, diverse cover where you have different stages of growth in different places. And uh, the idea of haying a field and removing all the cover at one time is never a good idea because you're left with short growth during the winter season when you need it most. But when we can engage in a good partnership with our tenant farmer, we can set plans ahead of season for how we're going to hay a field, where we're going to leave cover for wildlife, and where we're going to allow for a, a financial return. Hey Dan, I want to thank you for having us out. We really appreciate it. This has been a phenomenal opportunity. You bet. And if you want to learn more about the property, go to tnchuntclub.com.